the United States and the Soviet Union on a sheet of ice in Lake Placid, New York. Muller trying to turn. There's the left foot. What a tracking shot. Johnny Muller. If you see a 9-9, Olga Corbett won a gold medal. There it is. Five seconds left in the game. Do you believe in miracles? Yes! Unbelievable. You're listening to a podcast from Key Moments in Cold War Sports History, an online archive series showcasing the work of expert historians. I'm Vince Hunt and I'll be hosting the series, asking each guest to choose an important document or artefact they think is of great significance in the Cold War sports arena. This series of podcasts is looking at some of the political systems that made up the rivalry of the Cold War. We're looking at the US, the USSR, the GDR and South Africa. But one can't really look far at international competitions without coming across the issue of doping, or performance enhancement as it's known. Well, my next guest, Thomas Hunt, is an expert on this issue, and his book, Drug Games, looks at the history and the politics of doping. Uh, Thomas, the rivalry between the US and the USSR on the international stage was also a chemical rivalry, wasn't it? That's right. Um, You know, the US and and the USSR, there was a rivalry over virtually everything. Um, During the Eisenhower administration, there was actually a, a debate between Nikita Khrushchev and Vice President Richard Nixon over the size and utility of a Soviet versus an American kitchen. And so if a kitchen was a site of rivalry, then you know that um, from space to culture, arts and letters, to the athletic field, there was a, a major superpower rivalry. As part of that drive to have better athletes, of course, drugs got involved. And so it became very much bound up in this larger cultural and scientific rivalry between the two superpower blocks. Is it possible to put start and finish dates on this, let's not call it the Cold War, let's call it the Chemical War? In a way, there is. Um, The 1950s, it's kind of interesting. There was um, a Soviet weightlifting coach and an American coach who got together at, at a meet, and they, from my understanding, had a few too many drinks together. And the Soviet coach blurted out that they were using these new pills that were really enhancing the ability of their athletes. And so from there, the U.S. coach went back, and all of a sudden we see this kind of step up in interest in in performance-enhancing drugs over time. But it's really not until 1960 and the death of a Danish cyclist that um, that we sort of mark as the beginning of the major war um, regarding drugs. And so uh, from that point forward, of course, there were amphetamines in the, uh, in the 50s and 60s, and then it ramped up to anabolic steroids and then human growth hormones. So 1960 and then until the end of the Cold War, certainly it was a major problem or major issue. So 1960 onwards then. Right. Can it be said that the Olympics are clean after that, or does it take a while for this uh, attainting, this drug enhancement to become more or less prevalent? Can we say, therefore, then, that uh, the Olympics then become tainted from this moment on? That depends on, on your perspective. Um, increasingly over time, I'm, I'm less interested in, or, or I think less of drugs as, as wrong than I used to growing up. Drugs were very much a part of big-time sport by, by the late 60s, early 70s. And so whether or not it's been tainted ever since, well, certainly drugs have been present in large numbers ever since. And is it the case that coaches see that they can get uh, enhanced performances out of their athletes? And uh, were there rules? There were no rules against this at the time. There were no rules. Well, there was actually a rule passed by the International Olympic Committee prior to the Second World War. But nobody really paid any attention to it um, until 1960 when when the death happened. Um, After that, you saw a lot of thought put into how can we address this situation, but it wasn't until seven years later that a medical commission was empowered to develop rules and regulations. And and in fact, the the first drug test in international sport didn't happen until 1968, a very limited drug test that focused primarily on amphetamines and, um, and couldn't really test for anything else because there wasn't a test. I think it's, it's also important to mention as we're talking about the Cold War that neither superpower side had a big incentive to push against doping. 
And so national governments weren't, weren't going to do much to force the hands of private sports administrators. And I think that had a lot to do with this explosion among athletes, certainly in the GDR, in a state-sponsored program. Um, the Soviets were, at least from what we know, were doing some of the same things. In America, though, it's sort of an interesting phenomena that happened, that America knew that they were falling behind. And so coaches and administrators in some ways turned a blind eye when they could. They, they didn't actively make athletes dope, but they turned a blind eye to it when it was happening. Um, it wasn't until the end of the Cold War that that situation reversed and one's reputation for fairness became much more important on the international scene and that trickled down to athletics where all of a sudden you see at the end of the Cold War governments everywhere really pushing Olympic authorities to have stronger tests. So I think this Cold War dimension played a huge role in the history of performance enhancement. Can you give me an example of a sporting rivalry fueled by performance enhancing chemicals that grips the imagination of the world? I think the former German Democratic Republic, East Germany, um, had some 10,000, this is probably a low estimate of 10,000 athletes that were essentially either forced or, or willingly used drugs on their own, um, some at extremely high levels. And, and so this allowed a country really the size of Tennessee to start beating the United States badly on the Olympic fields and coming close to surpassing the medal counts of the Soviet Union. And so I think with the German Democratic Republic on the scene, the United States that ramped up this this rivalry on the on the international sports world. So one of the great things about performance enhancing chemicals it means that almost anybody, any sporting minnow for example, can start to challenge a great sporting monolith and you have some examples of that. A good example is uh, an American weightlifter in the the late 1970s, Ken Patera. His big rivalry on the international sports scene was a Soviet lifter, a Soviet superstar name of Vasily Alexiev. And Ken Patera made the argument that, well, last time around, I couldn't afford his drug bill, and now I can. So now we're going to see who's are better. His drugs are mine. And um, I think that really captures the state of this superpower rivalry. I think it's also interesting that that statement by Patera appeared in the New York Times. And no American sports official pushed for him to receive any sort of punishment. So it was very well known. Um, but again, a sort of blind eye was, was turned in order for this superpower rivalry to, to take place. Can you give me some example of how much better the performance-enhanced body performs than the non-performance-enhanced body? That is a really difficult question because figuring out causation I don't think is, is an easy open-and-shut case. A lot of people talk about, for example, the East Germans and Soviets, that the only reason they were any good was they were using drugs. And I don't think that's the case. They had extremely advanced sports systems and extremely advanced training systems. Um, so knowledge as to how to weightlift, for example, can play just as big, a bigger role in developing an elite athlete than, than steroids can. And so figuring out the balance of, was it steroids that made that happen? or was it the way that they trained or some combination of the two, I think you have to look at it as shades of gray rather than drugs made them better and it's obvious. This drug use though did lead to deaths, didn't it? And, and in some way that was the beginning of the end of this rampant use of drugs. I don't think that there's an end to the rampant use of drugs. I think that they are, they are used just as much as they had been. Um, I think that our system for spotting athletes who use drugs is much more advanced. And advancements are happening all the time, but they're certainly not out of sport now, or we wouldn't keep having scandals every other day in the newspaper. Um, I do think it had become apparent that drugs were potentially harmful. And I think you need to think not just of deaths, but of, uh, of which there have been a few. But there are all sorts of, of non-lethal effects on the body that are also harmful. Um, they can have impacts on, on one's appearance, uh, on one's voice, on one's reproductive system. Um, I think all of these worries combined together um, 
produced an effort for reform. Uh, I don't think it was only medical concerns that produced an effort for reform. I think the, um, the notion that of unfairness that this athlete doesn't have a good, as good a chance as another because they aren't using drugs played an equal role in pushing for a different system. I think if we go back to, to the interest of national governments towards the end of the Cold War, in 1988, Ben Johnson tested positive in spectacular fashion at the uh, Seoul Olympic Games. And the, the Canadian national government was so offended, was so embarrassed that a Canadian athlete had tested positive like this, that they instituted a huge governmental investigation, the Dubin Commission, that exposed a lot of what was going on both within Canada and in the international world. And, and that sort of embarrassment that Canada had done something unfair via the proxy of one of their athletes produced a lot of, um, a lot of the political momentum for a new system to be put in place, for much more effective testing and much more effective policies to be put in place. Virtually everybody on the track when Ben Johnson tested positive had at one point in their career tested positive or been implicated in a scandal. And I think by and large that's correct, that, um, that a lot of people were using it and Ben Johnson was sort of taken as the face of a problem that was much bigger than himself. But he did get down that track in such a rapid uh, time that it, it does beg a belief, doesn't it? It does. It, certainly, there's no doubt in my mind that he was using drugs. Um, and I remember as a kid, I was 10 years old, watching that race. And it was even bigger at the moment than Usain Bolt's um, shattering of the record more recently. Um, I think because it was such a spectacular, both a spectacular run and, uh, and the defeat of Carl Lewis, his, his great American rival, that there was so much interest around the world by the media, by spectators, that shattering the record in the way that he did and then immediately testing positive for a steroid just shocked the world in, in a way that had never happened previously. I mean, some of the official reactions to, these, uh, uh, to this problem of doping uh, made me laugh, really, when I, I was reading this. This year, the President's Commission on Olympic Sports into Doping prepared a final report which said the US is lagging behind other countries, failing to recognise the importance of medical research to athletic programmes, meaning they, we're underestimating the, the impact that doping is having on other people's athletes. We need to get with it. That's correct. The President's Commission on Olympic Sport, there are passages that you can read that really lament the fact that Americans weren't, American coaches and administrators weren't actively pushing their own athletes to use drugs, lamenting the fact that those on the other side of the Iron Curtain had opportunities to do so that, that American athletes didn't. Now certainly that does not mean American athletes weren't using drugs, they just weren't doing so under a state-sponsored program. Um, in some ways, that's, in fact, more dangerous and certainly less athletically effective than what was going on on the other side of the Iron Curtain. Um, American athletes were in large part left to their own devices, were self-experimenting with their drugs, and, uh, and that, to me, is a very dangerous situation where athletes at their own devices without input of a physician, man, that's scary stuff. What percentage of, of world sport, would you say, was, was affected by the use of performance-enhancing chemicals? I think the entirety of the world of sport was, was affected by the use of performance-enhancing chemicals. Certainly, different sports are affected in different ways. Um, a a um, biathlete who skis and shoots, for example, may not benefit as much from, from one type of drug as compared to another. So what was being used by whom differed, but I don't think there's an area of sporting competition that fell outside of this, of this drug issue. It was everywhere. It was everywhere. You've been listening to a podcast from the series Key Moments in Cold War Sports History, a project bringing together experts from around the world and hosted here on the Wilson Centre's online digital archive at digitalarchive.org.
These podcasts are part of the project The Global History of Sport in the Cold War, which is sponsored by the National Endowment of the Humanities, directed by Professor Bob Edelman of UC San Diego, Professor Chris Young from the University of Cambridge, and Dr Christian Osterman of the Woodrow Wilson Centre, and run in collaboration with the German Historical Institute Moscow, the Jordan Centre for Advanced Russian Studies at New York University, and Pembroke College, University of Cambridge. The presenter is Vince Hunt and the series is produced by Vince Hunt and Laura Deal.